Canadian investors are using ZSP over any other ETF for exposure to the S&P 500 index. Institutional investors, investment advisors, and DIY investors have all been trusting ZSP with their investment dollars since the fall of 2012. ETFs provide instant access to a portfolio of stocks to investors in a single cost-efficient trade. For an investor to own the entire index would require institutional level trading systems and expertise. To accomplish this, an investor would have to buy 500 stocks at a time, and then as the market moves, it would constantly have to rebalance with 500 stocks several times a year. ZSP simplifies this process by aiming to provide instant access to the 500 stocks in the index in a very easy and low cost way. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back or have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour episode 153. As always, joined by the three amigos, Boomer, Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, Rich Diaz. What's going on? What's I going on is my, just... mother is my mother <laughs> is trying to involve herself in the podcast. Mama Diaz. <laughs> Mama D. Mama D. Yeah. It's a, uh, <laughs> get her on think... one, one episode, maybe for the 200th episode. We I think should. we go, we, we do the, uh, you know, bring your, bring your mama to work day episode. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. You can teach us about religion and politics. Yeah. So she knows Mrs. Mrs. Ice Cap has left the house for a couple of days with uh, with the wee one to go to PEI for some concert, which means I'm home alone. Guess what I'm going to do tonight, Rich? Looney Hour meetup. I'm going to rager uh, tonight. What's your address? <laughs> it is well. It, it's at Ben Rabido's house. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Speaking of Ben Rabideau, we'll be, uh, yeah, the boys will be in Ottawa this Saturday, this Saturday for our Looney Hour meetup. Uh, tickets are sold out, so we do appreciate everyone's support. Looking forward to it. We got Ben Rabideau coming out. First time leaving his uh, his cabin all year. So he's making the trip. We're, yeah, I'm going to look, I'm looking forward to Ottawa. I haven't been there for a few years, but that's fun. And I think it might lead into another conversation we met, we talked about offline, see, maybe earlier. What about Ben's right. address? <laughs> <laughs> no, the Ottawa version. The the companies were being boycotted and stuff like that. I think you said. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. We'll go to that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Okay. What else, Rich? What's new up your way? Uh, another other than being harassed by my mother, nothing. It's all good. I'm I'm. This is big news for me. I'm I'm finally moving out on my own at the uh, the ripe old age of thirty nine. <laughs> Um, maybe that'll help in the dating game. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's been an interesting time you in my life. Sorry, where am I moving? To, no, when? So, to, well, when and where? Oh, this week after after I get back from Ottawa. I'm all, my stuff is mostly there. I've just been waiting for the internet to get set up. And uh, and where downtown, close to Westmount. If if you know anything about Montreal, it's Westmount is like the is the bougie area. So let's, that's let's a just cool... call it leafy line now so when you're chatting with someone you want to become friendly with you can say hey by the way i have my own place <laughs> yes it's nice it's nice yeah it's good it's time <laughs> so there you go oh. that's it all right well there it is big day what's the address <laughs> it's, uh... well, i almost said it i almost said it <laughs> lunar <Lunyar> math <laughs> Lots. So yeah, there's lots going on in the, uh, the employment space. We had last week, uh, after we recorded the, had Canada's employment data came out U S jobs. Uh, we had the ECB announcement, uh, today, actually U S CPI yesterday, lots going on in markets. Um, again, I think lots of volatility. So rich, the Canada unemployment rate, uh, ticked higher last week. I think it was what? Six, six point six percent now. So I think it's up 1.8 percentage point off the low which is, yes, sir. can you remind me of this, the, what everyone kind of quotes now is the, the Sam rule? Oh boy. Uh, I think it's up, well. <laughs> it's, it's up a full percentage point. I think off the lows is typically an indicator of like basically. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just thank God for the internet, um, which is the national unemployment rate rises by 50, 50 basis points. So point 
0.50 percent points over the relative low during its previous 12 months. So we're at one, one, we're 1.8 percent. Yeah, we're it's we're we've broken through this number. Sam, Sam, like we we've said it before on the pod, like the, the, whether or not um we are going to we are in a recession or not a recession, it's purely academic. I think we've been in, in a in a balance sheet recession for many quarters. Um, real uh, real estate will tell you that. Retail sales, consumer confidence is okay. Business comp, business investment is down. I mean, t- and indicator after indicator tells you that we've been in a recession for a long time. Um, prop, propped up by population growth. And the SAM rule would corroborate that. So I'm kind of curious. Well, we're going to get to that because I got some thoughts on on population growth as well as it pertains to what's happening in the housing market right now. But um, I th- found it interesting, Rich. I think was the youth unemployment continued to tick higher in particular. I think that's where you're seeing a lot of um, disgruntled. What, what, <laughs> what, what, gen are, what gen are they are now? They're Gen Alpha. Well, Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Does Crazy. that make Wait sense? Wait a second. Wait a second. No, makes no sense. <laughs> Gen, which is the newest one? The Alpha? Gen Alpha. I get it now. We've gone <laughs> through the alphabet. Now we're going through Alpha and Beta is next? Well, you're technically, I'm going to, I'm going to, hopefully I'm not going to get in trouble, but you're technically, I think, a Generation Xer, <laughs> Keith. <laughs> No, but as we go down, fake news. The fake Alpha, news? <laughs> Beta, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot. Yeah. We, so Steve there. and I are Generation Y, which is AKA Millennials. And then there's Generation Z. Um, and then there's Generation Alpha. And Generation, and that, and people, and, and Steve is right. So people aged 15 to 24, which is, there's a really good note from the National Bank of Canada on, on this. You can just Google it. And they show, that that unemployment rate is the highest it's been since basically 2012, which is kind of wild. So not good. I mean, that's where I think you're seeing all this, like the social frictions around immigration, how much like the politics of it have turned. I mean, it's interesting because like, if you look at voting intentions in Canada at the federal level, like typically speaking, the younger generations tends to gravitate to be more sort of left leaning, right? NDP liberal. Uh, and they're right now polling pretty, pretty aggressively on the conservative side, um, which is unusual. It, it's unusual. I think that, uh, so I, again, I don't know if that's just the prospects of owning a home, uh, the, the ability to gain, get a decent job after paying tons of money for a post-secondary education, it's interesting. It's the economy, stupid. <laughs> I beat Keith to it, right? I, so th- that was Bill Clinton's political advisor famously said. His name, I think it's James Carville or whatever, the guy, the bald guy. Uh, he he basically said, you know, it's the economy, stupid. And I think that that's really what you're seeing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we keep saying this all the time. You know, 2010 onwards, we had over a decade where, you know, they try to flatline everything, the cost of money, the economy, you, know, you, you name it. And now all of a sudden people are starting to experience real life, you know, like you, Rich, for example, you're going to go out in the real <laughs> world now and <laughs> buy your own groceries. Up. And when you make your own sandwiches now, are you going to cut the crust off or just eat it whole? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Probably. Maybe. But back to Steve's point, though, I, I think what everyone today is is – we're realizing we're seeing it. I was chatting with a gentleman uh, earlier today, uh, you know, talk about whether there's a recession now or not. And, you know, Rich, you, you can give us lots of data to suggest, yeah, we're clearly now in a recession. Anecdotal evidence. Some people say, yeah, things are getting tighter. I know for me, uh, I, I don't have any friends who've lost their job. If I go out to the stores, like people are still in there. So I don't think we've hit that, you know, hard landing at all yes but things are getting a bit tighter and to see to your point this is this is the first time in 15 years that anyone alive you know has been experiencing this and you know and fortunately or unfortunately it doesn't matter when that happens you know it's kicked the bums out you know and that's referring to uh you know the, the political leaders of course and that's what? why i think why that's why we're swinging one direction to the other 
just on that side front, I find it interesting. Like, you know, you're always kind of looking at like the anecdotes and, you know, I have conversations very, very frequently with people in the real estate industry of all professions, right? It's developers, property managers, mortgage people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the one sort of overwhelming takeaway that I've gotten over the last month or so has been there is some real weakness in the rental market. Um, not just in the GTA, but here in Vancouver where I am, um, like rents are declining, Rich. I know we've kind of argued and debated this in the podcast, but like in real time, it's really, really interesting. Like basically like there's uh, plenty of examples out there where everything in Vancouver would typically rent out in like a week, two weeks, there'd be like multiple applications. And what we're seeing now and hearing things is it's taking months to rent places out um, and, and stuff that was previously rented out like last year for 3000 bucks a month is being relisted at 3000, dropping to 2950, dropping again to 2900, you know, and then getting a bid at 2875. So I find that, yeah, go ahead, Boomer. Is, is, is that because there's more supply coming on or there's less demand or people losing their jobs. They can't afford it. Like I'm really curious. Why is it happening? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's part of like a typical like real estate cycle. Like, you know, you can only push rents up so much. I mean, they've gone up tremendously over the last three, four years. And I think it kind of just reached this natural ceiling, but I also think it's like, Hey, it's, I think it's the economy. I think that's just like, as the economy starts to falter, like, rents are a function of the labor market. I mean, you can only you can only charge so much as to how good the labor market is. If people start losing their jobs or they're not confident in in their job prospects or they're not getting the wage hike that they think they're getting, like they're just not going to they're not going to there's not going to be upward mobility, right? They're just going to stay where they are at or they might even move back home if they if they lose their job. And so, I think on the other side, I'm starting to hear things about um the foreign student reductions uh, around. So there's been, I was chatting with the property manager saying they got a bunch of vacancies kind of like fairly close to like UBC. And he's like, this is so weird. Like we're like in the fall market. Like this should be, this should be rented out in a day and it's sitting here. Like what, what's going on? And so, and, and I'm kind of hearing that, you know, we, we talked about the global mail article last week about um, these, these cities in the, in the GTA region um, that are suddenly seeing their rents decline rather significantly because instead of renting out to eight students, those eight students are no longer available and they're having to rent it out to like some local family. Yeah. So anyways, Talk- I, that's just my anecdotes in the rental market. I think it's interesting. I think it is a function of the economy of the labor market of, I think what's happening on the population immigration side. I think all the policies that have been reversed, I think are maybe starting to slowly filter through that might not show up in the immigration data just yet, but. Yeah. No, I think you're totally right. I think you're totally right. And um, so do we want to just go over the numbers, Steve? Or because I think we, we jumped over that. And I think some of the people will listen. Well, let me just add to that first is more from anecdotal, because like one gentleman I was speaking with, he runs a small business. And like he said, hey, Keith, you know, I'm now getting lots of job applicants coming in. He said before I had none coming in and he was screaming to, to find people to help him you know, with work. He said he's starting to see that now. He sees his vendors that he deals with. Uh, they're starting to get a bit tighter on, on things as, as well. So he's seen it. Another guy I spoke with, he's in the commercial real estate kind of world. And there wasn't a lot of positive comments from that perspective as, as well. So, um, you know, cause I know Rich, you, you mentioned earlier that, Hey, the recession has started and, you know, in compared to the G7, it hasn't started. <laughs> But there's a lot of national, we'll go into the national data points, of course, now, but anecdotally, we're starting to see these things. So overall, you know, we always talk about, you know, the trend and the path and everything. I don't think that's changed. We're still going towards the direction of things getting a bit tighter. Yeah, Rich, right. I mean, I don't know if you if you have any other comments on that. No, I just wanted to just, I think sometimes it's, I think that people like rely on us for like the literal da- data points. And I, I sort of, I get off on that. So I oh really boy, like here we so go. If you don't Everyone mind strap just in. going, <laughs> just quickly doing it. So unemployment did rise to 6.6%. Um, it, but, uh, but at the same time, 
employment growth was positive. And people say, how is that possible? It's because we had more labor supply than labor demand. So that's how you can have both of those things be true. A couple of things that I thought was were really interesting and kind of, I mean, not so hot for the labor market again, just really quickly was where um, the unemployment is starting to rise. We talked about youth unemployment. That's at a 15 or 16 or whatever math is year high of 14.5. That's almost up to 2009 peak already. So that's why I wanted to like, we're not even in this quote unquote recession. And yet youth unemployment is as high as it was in 2008, nine. Um, you know, um, th that's the other thing. I think the other thing was also people on online talked a lot about part-time employment <clears throat> and indeed part-time employment rose more than full-time employment. But I think that that's a red herring. Part-time employment has been flat for basically 15 or 25 years. And it's really full employment that matters. And that's where we're seeing a slowdown. And then two more things, which is participation rate and employment rate. So Canada's participation rate has been very, very high for prime age workers. Um, it's in the 80s or whatever it is. And that's starting to roll over, which to me is a really, really big sign. Um, and yeah, it's now 88.4 down from about, you know, you know, 89. It doesn't sound like a big number, but those, those percentage changes really matter. And then the employment rate. So not the unemployment rate, the employment rate, how many people actually physically work, you know, it's now down almost, almost a full 2% almost a, a point and a half which is these are big moves um, uh, from when so, yeah. when, when is that down oh from? sorry that is basically from 2023 it was mid 23 that, that it was it peaked i was at 62 and a half and now it's at 60.8 so i know those, those numbers don't sound like a lot but those moves matter and the other thing that's really really important about the labor market and then we can move on if you want to is that what the sam rule expresses and what a lot of people will tell you is that these changes in unemployment rate are non-linear. <clears throat> and that's what people don't get. I mean, it's like once you have unemployment start to accelerate, it is virtually, it basically never happens that it, it's, that it goes down again. It, you often get, once it starts to accelerate, it goes up and it spikes, which tells you that the, you were in a different cycle and that this, these unemployment rates start to, it's a vicious circle. Uh, you know, it start, people start to hold back on their spending which causes more unemployment rate, which causes more holding back on spending and et cetera, et cetera. So just something, unfortunately, to be aware of. And I, I just want to chime in on that because I think that's like a really good point is just from like a confidence perspective, Rich, like people just, when people start pulling back, it's almost like self-reinforcing. Yeah. Um, And I just think I'm, I'm seeing some stuff in the housing market that I'm like, hmm, okay. I, I kind of, caution this I, again i don't get everything right on housing but i i think i said to everybody that coming into september october this is two very very important months for the housing market because this is your fall selling season if you have product and inventory that you want and need to move you basically have two two and a half months before the housing market basically shuts down in december and january so if you have stuff to move you're going to have to get more aggressive. And I caution people that just because rates recline, we said this to a lot of our sellers too, just because rates are dropping, which everybody parroted, right? Oh, rates are, rates are dropping. Mortgage rates are down. Bank of Canada is cutting rates. Housing market's going to pick back up. And I said, I don't know. Like, why are they cutting? People are losing jobs. You don't have the confidence. What we're seeing right now, it's pretty early, but it's, it's two weeks into the September market. There's a flood of listings. So all the listings are coming on just as they normally do in the September housing market. And the demand, sure, it's picked up a little bit from the doldrums of the August summer market, but it's nowhere close to matching the supply that's coming onto the market right now. So I think this is going to be that fall market that is going to disappoint a lot of people. And you know, you could have some desperate sellers come December. And again, I don't know what the market looks like february march april next year but i can tell you like i think there's a pretty clear idea of what the next two to three months look like and um i think it's going to be challenging for for a lot of people that i think bought into the hopes and dreams of rate cuts automatically mean a better housing market so i mean so what we're talking about now is market psychology yeah and it doesn't have to be when i say market it has to be financial markets it can be housing market it can be market to buy a new car or 
you know, a vacation or something. And as soon as people start to hear the anecdotal stories, you know, that hey, their neighbor lost their job or, you know, amongst my friends, you know, I know some people this year, they're usually you would do Tuscany and the South of France in the same trip. Now you're only going to do the South of France. You got to cut it short, you know, because it's a rough, it's a rough uh, neighborhood. Wrong there. choice, by it, the way. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a rough, rough lifestyle for, boom, to go. for boomers, right? Because we're the, we're the uh, fault of everything. Uh, but to get back to the psychology, the psychology story, it, it's all of a sudden people will start to uh, hold back spending. They'll save it a little bit more. They won't do a higher end trip to do a lower end trip or no trip and, and things like that. And all, that actually then contributes to the cycle, you know, in which we rolled over. And, you know, uh, you know, I had a conversation with someone yesterday, you know, we both said, hey, recessions aren't bad. Now, take that back. If you lose your job, they are bad. OK, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to be. Yeah, I'm not trying to be callous, but just from a pure market perspective because it does cleanse out excess that's there and you know it, it, it again i keep going back all the time we had over a decade of excesses that were built up by this really wacky monetary policy and, and i think it started with mark carney back at the bank of canada and then he continued with it over and over in england and everything I had to but, get that one in <laughs> yeah, I'm pushed that out there. But you know, all the other ones, the all the other like Draghi, his name came back in the news media this week, which we will revisit, you know, that economic fantasy land called Europe. But they they created all these excesses and it's years later where now we gotta pay for it. And it's it's coming back slowly. And uh, fortunately for all these fellas, they're now gone. So no one's going to blame them. They can't connect the dots. But you know who can't connect the dots, Rich? We can. Yeah, the Looney Hour. We're, we, we <laughs> yes, I finally stuff. got one right. <laughs> I just want to round out my comments on Keith. You mentioned like the psychology of markets and, and sort of, you know, your world and my world are similar but different in the fact that, you know, when you're selling equities quite often you can just click a button and more or less most of the time there's liquidity there at the click of a button on the housing side i think where people are really getting caught up and this is becoming this self-reinforcing feedback loop which is people that want to move so like there's a lot of people that we talk to that you know they want to move right they want to upsize they want to change neighborhoods etc but they can see what they want to buy because it's sitting on the market and they've got time to go in there and buy it. Challenge is, is what are you going to get for your place? Like if you're selling your existing property to move to that one right now, like there's no, there's not a lot of price discovery and there's not a lot of liquidity. So for example, like, let's just say we think your place is worth a million. So your existing place is worth a million. You want to upsize that place that's 1.5. And so you go and make a purchase for 1.5 million. Now you got to turn around and sell your place for a million. And you got to do it relatively quickly because you don't want to be carrying two properties. But like what we're seeing is like, it might not be a million. Like when you actually put it to market, it might actually be 900. And like, these are big moves. Like in a normal market, you can be like, as a, as a realtor, I can go in there and I can price it out for you. And I can say, I'm going to sell you in two weeks and you're going to land between 980 and 995. I know with like 98% conviction, like that's what's going to happen. But in this market, it's like you're going in and pricing it. Like, listen, I think you're, a, you could be a million 25, but you could be 900. And people are like, well, 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 that's not really much of an answer. It sounds like a cost. I would just, like, I would just get a new realtor. <laughs> you know, maybe you should. That was but then very he, yeah, I mean, he you end up the getting these realtor. guys that will <laughs> promise these guys numbers and they say, oh, no, I'll get you a million bucks. And then you sit on the market for six weeks and then all of a sudden they're carrying two properties and they're hemorrhaging two mortgages. Uh, so this is why I think a lot of people like the transactions actually aren't happening is people just people don't know what their numbers are because there's just not enough liquidity in the market right now. And it's it's a moving target. So. We'll see. I don't think the pain. I love I don't think the pain's over yet. No, the pain is definitely not over yet. 
Now that savings rate piece, sorry, I know we're, we're jumping around here, but that savings piece is so interesting because there was somebody on the internet, on the Twitter box that I will not name him because he's an idiot. I think I know um, who he it was, is. He was talking about- I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> no, I'm who? not going to say his name, but but he's an idiot. And he was saying that the, the, the savings rate rising was an indication of the strength of the consumer. And, and I thought to myself, oh, okay, I'm a nerd. I'm going to go spend some time Googling this. And then there's like hundreds of papers by all kinds of people who are way smarter than me talking about basically during every recession since uh, the dawn of time, people start their savings rates actually go rise. And so it's, it's really that market psychology piece. We should, we should be, we should come back to it one day and really sort of explore more about that and how it changes in different sectors. And, 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 and by the way, it also, it's the same is true on the other side of the cycle. When we eventually do get through this cycle in Canada and elsewhere, that market psychology will swing the other way. And it, it, it's, it's the beginning of, of something new, a new cycle. His so it's also in called the, uh, description. It's in the show notes. The description notes. Yeah. And you have the person's house address and yeah. their, <laughs> Banner yeah, Abidos yeah. is in there too. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but with this it, it's in a way, it's also talking about market sentiment in, in some yeah. way, you know, sometimes you can use it as not a perfect timing tool, but to say, okay, I think we're in that area. So, as, so I think, Steve, what you're describing, same with you, Rich, for this economic cycle, what you're saying is is one of these, like, things can snowball pretty quickly. And right now, at the ball at the top of the hill, it's slowly starting to roll over. You can visualize, of, of course, right, Rich? And yeah, I know what a snowball Yeah, yeah like. I can yeah. go pretty quickly. <laughs> so to get out in front of it, like what you would say, Steve, you're like, oh man, I'm selling my house now or I'm not going to buy yet. I can afford not to buy. But that's only for people though who are, they don't have to sell something, of course. But in, you know, we see this now in certain financial markets as well where sentiment is is pretty bad or good. But again, I it continues, all the research that we look at in our own in-house research from, you know, the guy with the glasses and, and stuff, <laughs> You guys both it, have it glasses. Is. Who is that? Who's doing the research? <laughs> uh, the magic eight ball says the, uh, but it, it again, and we are trending towards that moment in time where things have not turned yet. And before they do get better, you know, it has to get a little bit worse. So the good point with this, uh, if anyone, if they do have liquidity, whatever market you're looking at, may, maybe the buying opportunity is not that far away. Yeah, maybe it's three months or two years. So you don't, and don't think about this day by day stuff. But it has to get bad before it gets better. And when it gets better, as I think Steve you mentioned or Rich, I don't know, it, yeah. it gets better very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, Rich was you when you were describing the uh, the unemployment rate how it went up. Uh, exponentially yeah, it's just like we always right, right now we're in a, we're in a downslope but that eventually will change that's sorry that's what i was trying to say but central banks can stop this immediately they can <laughs> cut rates use qe use you know moral suasion and it's, it's all fixed <laughs> the ecb they just cut rates today boomer yeah. you uh did, did they have a press conference today did you watch it uh i read the notes Cold. <laughs> uh, I I imagine they had a presser. I, I wasn't available for it, but I was able to you know read read all the stuff with this. They, they seem to be towing uh, the party line, data dependent. Yeah, that's what they did, and um, I mean, so 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 two main things with them. Uh, you know, they cut rates. That was exactly as expected. Uh, so right now, for example, they're at three and a half percent. And they have they've two cut, meetings left. They've cut 25. 50 basis points. So they're they're one behind the BOC. Yeah, ex absolutely. They have two meetings left for this year. And the market is expecting another 50 basis points and cuts. So, you know, 25, 25. Out to next July. So, you know, 10 months maybe. The market is forecasting they're going to be at 2%. So 150 basis points and cuts between now and next July. What do you think? Is is that realistic? Are you are you taking the under or the over? Well, let's cut. If so, go back to remember during the pandemic days when you know and they started to raise rates, and we all said here, hey, they're going to get stopped out. They're not going to be able to go from zero to 
two or three and you know they went to five because there was no accident along the way uh you know whether all of these central banks you know including the europeans and the brits and canadians or else can you know can go from five back down to two in response to no accident you know maybe it happens i i don't think it's gonna i think something else bigger will happen in between but think about it right now the market is saying for europe they're going to go from four down to two within 12 months. And it's all glory. And There's GDP nothing... is going to stay relatively elevated. I have a question. Well, yeah, yeah. I have a question. Did one of, did anybody from the ECB or the German political class or anybody from Europe tweet out that they're cutting interest rates because their economy is doing so well? I just want to know. <laughs> Best, the first in the G7 to cut three times. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah. great. Germany's unemployment rate is now at six point something and rising. Their industrial production is down God knows how much. I tweeted about that the other day. Uh, you don't did cut you, rates because your economy is doing spectacularly well. It's just that's such a lot. Did you guys watch and the de- you guys watch the debate? No, uh, I, I Trump, can't do that. Trump Harris. Yeah. No, I, I did not. I think for those things, you can pick off the, the highlights the next uh, Well, I day. mean, the highlights was, was one, Rich, they talked about the um, Trump basically decried the, the German uh, energy policy as being uh, completely catastrophic, um, which probably coincides with, with some of your commentary. Yeah. And uh, I think the, I don't know which it was, but it was some German government Twitter account. Like it was, it was related to the government. And they basically just said, like, there's nothing wrong with our energy policy. This guy's an idiot. I mean, both of those things can be true. And the reality is that Germany's energy energy policy has been an absolute and total disaster. I don't care what anybody says, Trump or anybody else. Um, they have the highest or most expensive energy prices in Europe, literally, uh, in the EU. And if you look at their industrial production... Um, it is now down from a peak in 2018. It's almost down 20 odd percent in real terms. Um, it's down from the post COVID high at about 10%. Their capacity utilization, which is, is what it says on the tin, how much of your uh, industry you are using is down, I think at a 10 year low. I can't even remember. I'm sorry, I'm, that, that number is escaping me right now. And the other thing that I think is really important is that Germany, it's basically exposing Germany's um, business model, economic model as totally bust. I mean, uh, Rich, Germany, yeah, sorry, I can go on and on. Sorry. So here, here's the uh, here's the tweet. It's, fr- it's from the German foreign office. So it's like a verified uh, government account. And they tweeted, they said, it's a picture of Trump at the debate. And then they tweeted and they said, like it or not, Germany's energy system is fully operational with more than 50% renewables, and we are shutting down, not building, coal and nuclear plants. Coal will be off the grid by 2038 at the latest. P.S. We also don't eat cats and dogs. Like, what do you say to that? Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> they're like bragging about shutting down nuclear, which is bizarre, but um, I, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, the, but back to the, um, you know, what do you, I don't know how to move away from that, but uh, <laughs> I do have one comment about the debate that we will, I want to go back about to the dogs. No, it's much more serious than that. <laughs> um, the cats. By the way, by the way, we don't deserve dogs. Dogs are the most amazing companionship friendship that anyone, anyone could have. Uh, next to you two guys, of course. Yes, right? of course. Because, you're talking about yeah. the ECB, Keith. That's what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, before. absolutely. So one thing the ECB did, you know, they, you know, they like to provide a, a trend, expectation, estimates of where the economy is headed, but they've also now they they continue to lower the growth expectations for the eurozone as a whole, and so now for 24, 25, and 26, loony hour math. That's three years. <laughs> They've now lowered their growth estimates, you know, for the euro area three years out. And uh, at the same time, their expectation for inflation, uh, for headline inflation, it's saying flattish, like they haven't adjusted that. And if you exclude energy and food, which I don't know why you'd want to, because you know, most people don't eat or go anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> especially the Germans, apparently. <laughs> but uh, you know, those numbers are, you know, they're they're sticky. So it, it, you know, I think I commented. I think the Americans are starting to show stagflationary data points. Uh, here is Europe is is showing it as well. And, you know, the expectation for them to cut rates, another 150 basis points, it, it, not, that just doesn't reconcile. You can't have a gradually slowing economy, inflation staying high where it is, your economic growth engine, you know, losing market share to everyone and already showing, you know, recessionary data points. And central bank going from 350 down to down to two and everything is is awesome. There's again something is not quite right with that area, but you could also argue the same for here in Canada, you know, for the Americans and, and the Brits and Japan and everywhere else. And this is what I like because it does show that there's a lot of complacency right now. And uh, but Europe is this really odd economic experience. But there's parts of Europe that are absolutely smashing it, though, which is like Poland has had an amazing run in its GDP per capita. It's caught up to all kinds of countries in South America. Um, There are some relative success stories within Europe, but the big guys are not doing well. Yeah, yeah. so you got the big, what's the big three now? I guess Spain is number three? No, No, Italy. So yeah, the French, the Germans, and and the Italians. Obviously, they're... You have those in place, and there's always going to be someone new that that's doing yeah. well, and Poland's doing well for you know for their own reasons and everything. Um, but but overall, though, you know the the German story you, you have to look at it, and I know the Greeks are watching them right now, and they're <laughs> thinking you know, maybe maybe the Greeks are having their last laugh because the Germans. Let's let let's make no mistake about this. You know, over a decade ago, you know the the Germans put the boots right on right on the Greeks gave them no leeway whatsoever like they were just bastards can we say that word i think so okay we said it somewhere but... michael nicoletto's is looking down that's having right. a good shuffle <laughs> yeah he's he's agreeing he's like yeah yeah get him get him keith uh but you have that happening there right now um but the biggest ch- so here's something for you guys to think about this is like the, how the mind works here at ice cap with me so very briefly on the debate, on the American uh, uh, debate a couple of nights ago, there was some expectation that Harris wouldn't do very well. On the face of it, she did fine. She didn't trip up anywhere. Mm-hmm. You can split hairs on, you know, two plus two equals whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but if you exclude, you know, the gotcha politics, you know, she, did, she didn't trip up. It was okay. If that moves the world closer to the blob, winning the election in in November uh it it does place NATO another step closer to war with the Russians because it is it is happening as as we speak if there is an escalation in war on Europe's border then the economy gets crushed energy prices scream higher and again, I don't know how the ECB can go from three and a half to two. They might be going from three and a half to seven. You know, you could have could have the opposite monetary reaction to try to retain capital. Because if if we do go down this road, and, and I do believe that people are not assigning a high enough probability that we could have a global conflict coming on, then you know, capital will run away from where it's taking place. And uh, you know, lots of weird things happening in America right now. But money will go to the U.S., you know, for uh, for safety and liquidity. So that's how you sort of, you know, square. For, for me, that's how I square the last 48 hours, which is really interesting. Is this U.S. election is coming up when November, blah, 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 blah. Rich? 17th? 19th? I always said 7th or 5th. It's 5th, I think. It's in November. Fifth. Yeah, somewhere in there. But that, but that jumped out at me with the ECB uh, news today How as well. How about the uh, U.S., Rich, uh, you know, Shifting gears, U.S. jobs data last week. We had U.S. CPI, uh, what, yesterday? So, I, yeah, I don't I mean, know if there's any clear takeaway there. It seems the data is is still kind of trending weaker, but not that bad. That's, that's We're probably getting what, 25 basis points in September is, is probably the most likely scenario, not, not 50. 
Yeah, I mean that's how I would describe it. Slowly slowing, but not much weaker. I mean, uh, they I mean they increased jobs by one hundred and forty two thousand, um, and the unemployment rate changed a tiny bit to four point two, which is still okay. Um, one the one thing I thought was really interesting is the job gains were concentrated in construction and healthcare. But construction is just such an important part of the U.S. psyche um and literally just number of people who work in that business and all the tangential um and knock-on industries from that space um and so for that number to basically be doing okay is i think uh, is is just again pretty is just as stable and and it, that just means that the economy is okay and and just ticking along um i think that there was some other a couple other thing i thought was interesting which was um that um, and manufacturing was down. So people talk a lot about manufacturing, but I think that that's, I would argue it's probably more, that's not as important as it used to be. I mean, it used to be a huge part of the economy. It used to be 50% of, of total GDP and now it's in the twenties. So it's, but it still gets a lot of press and it still speaks to a lot of sentiment and that declined 24,000. Um, so that, those are the sort of the takeaways for me, but I think you're right, Keith. I think you nailed it. I'm sorry, Steve, that was, you, you nailed it really. It's just, it's declining, but still okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, the big thing with me, I mean, as you said, Rich, the jobs were a little bit softer than expected, but the average hourly earnings were sticky. Oh, yeah. And it's back to this yeah, stagflationary so that... environment. Playing devil's advocate here, but Rich, you, you'll probably know more about this than I will, but do w- wages tend to be a lagging indicator? Is that fair to say? I, I mean, I'm just playing devil's lab- advocate here. Yeah, no, no. I think it's a great question. Listen, that it's all these like sort of uh, rules of thumb that are true in many cycles, but aren't true in some cycles, but in general, labor markets are lagging indicators because yeah, we're not seeing mass. When you see mass layoffs, then people are willing to take a job and they're like, I'll take anything. I'll take whatever you want to pay me. So then you, you're right, Steve. So you can see the, uh, the wages coming down, but right now there's still job growth overall. Yeah. And you see, it's kind of like, that. We're in this awkward keeps, moment, right? We still haven't quite. You keep seeing all these through. sort of, you know, like unions and stuff, right? That have like their their contracts are coming up for renewal or negotiation. Like I think Air Canada is coming up here in the next week or two, and they're talking about potentially striking and all that other stuff. But my my like, Ottawa flight is unaffected. Apparently, I received an email. <laughs> did a you DM. actually? Did you get an email? Yeah, I got a DM from them to say uh, that my because it's not it's not. Because it's a smaller commuter route. Why the hell are they DMing you on Twitter? No email email. on my computer. It (laughs) pops up in the morning for the. (laughs) No, they were saying, but but, I'm not that dumb, guys. I know what an email and DM is. So they Uh, they were, you know, like obviously, yeah. I mean, you've you've gone through this period of significant way or or life increases, right? I mean, significant inflation. So obviously, you're almost playing catch up and saying, well, I'm going to negotiate what we just had to go through. So like, that seems like, oh, again, kind of like that lagging indicator. Yeah. It's uh, backward looking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. On a funnier note, I do wonder, like, as we kind of enter into this recession, a rising unemployment rate, be curious to see what happens with the, our, uh, our beloved public sector. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys were watching the news, but uh, there's a big strike and protest going on about uh, they're having to go back to the office three days a week. So the federal government employees rich is how much is how how many days (laughs) they have to go with the they're being mandated to go back to the office three days a week uh and so they're throwing massive protests i found the most i found like the the best thing that you can't script this is that as a result they are now protesting and um boycotting they're boycotting private businesses in downtown ottawa why would they boycott? Yeah, Small I guess because water. they are being forced to go downtown back to the office, and so if we're going to be forced to, don't spend. I don't know. It's it's very odd. I mean, it sounds like commies. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay, so here's my thought on the whole stuff. How much yeah, is that no, public sector grown, it. Rich? A uh, lot, a lot. I have I definitely have that chart I can share with you. People go t- tell us your piece, Keith, and I'll tell you the data. So, I mean, on one side, I think we should recognize that the, the world has changed and everyone does not need to 
I mean, I would agree for an hour. Yeah. And all that stuff. So I, I totally get that. And I do think that a lot of people can be extremely efficient working from home and Mm -hmm, you don't mm -hmm. need to go into the blob, you know, to see all that stuff. I totally get that. And I see the other side as well. It's a real tough one. I know the it private is. sector, it's easy to figure out because, you know, you're working on a, you know, a P&L, you know, profit and loss, whereas the private, the public sector doesn't have that, you know, culture. I think the outlash is, of course, that there's a stigma, of, of course, towards public employees in terms of work ethics, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> that dare people you. are How like, dare you, Steve. you know, <laughs> uh, so I think that's probably where, where rubber meets the road, but um yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you, Keith. It's interesting. I mean, I think like the one thing I, as, as someone in real estate follows along quite closely is how all these major metros are now trying to deal with people are only going back to the office, right? Like I think we're, I think a lot of these cities are only running at like 60% capacity of what they used to in terms of people coming to their offices. So what does that do for all these downtowns, right? That, that were built and dependent on people coming to the office four or five days a week. And when they come to the office, you know, you're, you're riding the public transit, you're buying a coffee, you're going for lunch and, you know, much of that activity is not happening anymore. And so you're seeing, of course, these downtowns are kind of decaying, which is, you know, not just from a property tax basis, um, but from, from a homelessness, crime use, uh, drug use, it's interesting. And so I think, you know, but, you can see why I, I think there's a concerted effort to to get people back into the office at least slightly more. And I kind of wonder, do the employees lose a lot of their leverage um, as the unemployment rate pushes higher? So y- yes, is the quick answer to that last part. But I would also say, you know, in the interest of not being commies, I mean, I think we have to let the market sort of do its thing, which is, we were pre, you know, a priori, we had did not have a technology that allowed us to work from home. N- now we do. And the market's going to shift and the mark, the market is often we think of the market as pricing, but there's also market of a market of decision making and behavior and, a- and actions. And so if, if people all mass decide that they no longer want this certain behavior because of this technology has been introduced, I don't think we should necessarily get ahead of it or out in front of it. Or, or necessarily try to manipulate it just because we want to go back to the old ways. However, on the other hand, I mean, the percentage of people working mostly from home in Ottawa is 10% higher than it is in Oshawa, Toronto, Halifax, and Hamilton. So it's 35 to 25 and 24. I'm looking at the chart right now. I can share it. And so there's a, and then we know that on, we know employment in that sector has gone up by nearly a, you know, 500,000 people over the last or geez, even more, almost a million more public, um, more public sector employment over the last four years. And so there's like this, they, they tell us on one hand that they're more efficient. They're not working in the office as much. And yet on the ground and anecdotally, we know that people are not getting the services that they say that they want and they're paying for. And so something there to me doesn't square. I think that's the way I sort of but see there, it. There is a lot of consistency, though, and you like to see that from a business perspective. <laughs> so, yeah. So, for example, you know, bef- when, when, when COVID hit, government was very consistent. They created these god-awful policies that ruined the economic <laughs> world in so many ways. That's why the price of bread has gone from two bucks to seven bucks. And now people were working from home. And now they what are they going to do? They're going to make them feel even more miserable by dragging them back to the office. So... You know, thumbs up for staying consistent. And that's all you want with your government. So I don't know what the uh, data is in Canada, but um, 49% of employees in the U.S. have returned to the office full time. So basically 49, you said 49, 50. Yeah. So 49% of employees have returned to the office full time. So you still have about half the workforce that is, is doing some form of hybrid or, or entirely work from home but i was also i bet you i bet you there's that word again i bet you the highest number that we'll get to would probably be 70 percent, and i think that's all you need again i don't think everyone has to commute into the big bad city every day for uh like i know this this one firm that we uh that i know um pretty well um one of one of the people working there she was commuting almost three hours round trip a day 
like just getting in and out of this downtown core. And so she's saving herself now. It's not quite five days a week, but mm -hmm. probably, you know, 15 hours plus added to her life to spend with her kids and whatever else. So like, I, you know, I don't know what the right answer is for the civil service and how they figure it out, but. Hey, that genie's out of the bottle. They ain't going to put it back in. I got a couple couple thoughts on that. Is have you guys noticed traffic like in your cities there? Like, has it gotten noticeably worse? Like, I can tell you, like in you know, you hear the horror stories in the GTA, of course, but in Vancouver, I can tell you it's gotten tremendously worse over the last several years. And I don't know if that's just a more people driving cars post pandemic, more population. I don't know what it is, but it's it's horrible. Yeah, so here in Halifax, those that don't know Halifax, it, it's a peninsula. So uh, it's, there's nowhere else to build but up. And there's only probably three main roads that come in onto the peninsula. Less people are coming in to work in the downtown core, but more people are living here now. So the roads are congested, Steve. It's You get gridlock every now and then where they decide to repair two of the main roads on the same day when the kids are going back to school. It took a lot of coordination for them to do that, but they did manage to to do it. People who are local in Halifax, you know what I'm talking about. It's a pretty good gridlock there a few days ago. But I think we know we we have that transition taking place. So the, the downtown course, they are growing, but it's not just a daytime growth. So it's so rich. I remember back in the 90s in, in London over in the UK. I think the daytime population for London was probably eight to ten million in that range. And then after five o'clock or six, you know, whenever people finally left, uh, it went down to about four million. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, yeah, yeah. The number that magnet, that order of magnitude is different, but the percentage is probably the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, that's. I mean, this is what I think. I think, like, just stepping back, I think, in a sense, that this whole work from home thing is gonna has not only transformed big cities and obviously transformed the people in Ottawa. But I think it also I think it actually might really, really help Canada. And the reason I think is the reason I think that's true is because Canada has a problem where people only go to like two cities. But mm -hmm. what if you can have the, and the real issue with Canada is not so much that we have immigration is that it's all two very concentrated pockets of our very large, mostly empty country. And I think that that maybe this is a way of sort of dealing with that issue, which is, you know, you find you want to work from home, but you're not allowed to live in Toronto. You have to live in the middle of freaking nowhere. And by doing that, what you in a sense do is you actually export capital, know-how, educated people, taxpayers, et cetera, to places that are maybe have been neglected for Jesus, a century? Who knows? But I don't know. I'm trying to think of a positive. No, I've, I've, seen that. I've seen that quite a bit with clients just, you know, relocating for for basically, hey, I've got more flexibility in my job now. And I might only have to go in once a week. So I'll go way out here or sometimes it's fully remote and it is packing up the office as well. Like I have a client that runs a, you know, small, medium business and they just, they folded the office downtown and everybody now just works remote and so Rich, Rich only works one day a week now, as far as I, <laughs> no. as far as I can tell. <laughs> oh, uh, but I don't know. I think that that Ottawa thing is really sort of an indictment. When you look at the chart, and hopefully Steve, you'll share it with our listeners. And if not, I'm sure I feel like you tweeted it a couple weeks ago. It, 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 there's obviously an outlier and the outlier only exists because the public sector does whatever it, want, it wants, basically. I mean, that's and that's not fair either. I think that's how we got on this uh, sort of in this conversation. It's just it's obviously something's not right. Um. Well, I mean, that's uh, guys, really, yeah. some, somewhat related. I was doing some research in our little uh, pantry the other day, and uh, I discovered Mrs. Ice Cap had this bag, like a Costco bag of uh, little coconut chocolate treats. Uh -oh. So they're called, right here, it's called the Unreal. Unreal oh, I've bar. Heard of those. Yeah. So because it's a big Costco bag, like, you know, I love coconut and, and chocolate. So uh, I've been <laughs> taking one every now and then because it's a big bag. You'll never Where know is this going. Difference. <laughs> it's a goes with if you just get a few out and no one notices but all of a sudden you you hit that slippery slope and all of a sudden the bag is nearly empty and like any moment mrs ice cap is going to realize uh-oh someone's been taking my 
my chocolates. She doesn't watch the podcast, so she'll never know that I'm <laughs> confessing to it. So uh, stay tuned for this story because, you know, I'm okay. confessing my sin, which I'm eating these things. Hey, the next... Uh, Looks like we're going to be looking for a new co-host. Yeah, the next Twinkie right. bed could be one of these. That's what it'll be for me. They're supposed the, to be bad. <laughs> the whole point is you lose and you have to do something bad. Well, this one has organic coconut and sugars. Yeah, Keith, we should do a we should do the next Looney Hour uh Twinkie bet, which is for for a nice tomahawk steak dinner. Yeah, there you go. That'd be nice. Okay. We'll do that. We'll do that. Okay, boys, we're gonna be in Toronto in a, no sorry, Ottawa in a couple of days. <laughs> sorry, where? Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> do so uh we'll do, we do that do we want to get a twinkie bet for the fed feds out september 18th so that will be i believe next wednesday oh. before we, before oh, we report yes. the pod of course it's very yeah, good let's do our Thank fed you. bet let's do our fed right. bet go, go we're keep, now an american podcast do you want me to go first yeah age go before ahead, beauty. Boomer. set set the tone okay so it's uh i have them down they're they're, they're going to cut 25 that's the in line and for you guys to know as well that's what the market is is pricing in it could be a little bit more but no one is uh the only one saying 50 are people trying to attract you know online attention you know with the big flames <laughs> in the background and, and stuff like that but i'm down for a 25 cut rich next yeah i think they're not gonna cut <laughs> Uh, I think that they're not going to cut. I think they're going to hold. I think the stock market's too high. Unemployment's ticking along. I think that uh, inflation, we didn't even talk about CPI, but the shelter component of CPI, C, uh, shelter, shelter component of CPI drove inflation. Um, and I think the housing market's okay. So I think that they're, they're not going to So cut. I'm going to take the opposite of Rich because I think that the shelter component is lagging. I think that uh, on the ground, as the REITs are describing out there, the REITs are showing us that rental apartment uh, rents are declining in real time. And so I think it's going to be a 50 basis pointer. Uh, we're going to keep things spicy. Okay. So either way, it looks like there'll be two Twinkies going down next week. Yeah. I'll tell you sure. what. This little treat is unreal. <laughs> oh my god. That's a good place to end it. Uh... <laughs> All right. As always, guys, we appreciate the support. Uh if you've enjoyed this episode, if you've enjoyed Keith talking about chocolates and, and coconut, uh leave us a five star review on Spotify Apple. It helps us get into the algorithms. I think we got like over twelve hundred reviews now on Spotify. It's pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. We do appreciate that. And so Leave us a review, share this episode with one friend, family member, allow us to continue to build the Looney R community. I was uh, looking at the numbers for um, some of our advertisers sending them. So the audience is still growing. We're growing here a couple, two years. So what, two, two years into it? Three. <laughs> is it three years? <laughs> Looney hour math. Jesus, Looney hour was. math. Yeah, well, we're still we growing. We are coming up on the three-year so. anniversary. And, but Steve is right. right. It, things are going up. We continue to have fun. That's what it's continue all about. Continue to have so. fun. Yeah, it's all that matters. Anyways, as always, guys, thanks again. We'll see you next week.